So welcome to Belgrade. Thank you. Um, we were wondering uh, how the world would look like without mathematics. How would the world look like without mathematics? That's an interesting question. When I was young, when I was a student in, in, in school, mathematics was for me the, the one thing that made sense and I didn't like some other subjects like history and I wasn't so interested in languages and so on. But then when you get older, you, you have a more broad appreciation that everything is necessary for the world. I mean, history and language and sociology and economics, things I wasn't interested in when I was younger and of course, mathematics. So I think the world would be a very different place without mathematics. Obviously, much of technology relies on mathematics. When you have a student in class who, who says, when will I ever use this? And then meanwhile, they're, they're working on their phone, sending a text or an email message, or checking their grades or buying something online with a credit card. All of the security for the internet depends on a combination of mathematics, some of very new mathematics from the last 30 or 40 years, as well as computer science and engineering. But if you take out the mathematics, I think we have to take your phone and your smart car and your television and your music and you're not left with very much. I mean, we've, the human, the human uh, person has made a lot of progress in the last several hundred years and so much of that has been due to science and mathematics and even if you look at the history of medicine, Florence Nightingale came up with statistical charts that nobody had thought of before and used those as a weapon to convince politicians that there were health disease crises that needed to be addressed. They didn't understand the numbers, but when they saw her pictures, and that was quantum leap in, you know, how we approach disease. And obviously in earlier times, people died very young because of disease. So mathematics has been helping treat human illness and extending human lifespan for several hundred years. Uh, it started in part by, by Florence Nightingale. So I think we all owe a lot to mathematics for our health and our luxuries in life. Why do you love mathematics? So, what was the reason that, that you pursued this career? Well, it's funny, when I was a student, uh, as I've mentioned, mathematics was the one thing that it was logical, so I, I, could, I, I didn't do very well in it, but I did okay. I could fit the pieces together, and when I started university, I thought I probably would study physics or chemistry because I actually didn't know that you could study only mathematics, and maybe Halfway through my first year, I found you can just study mathematics. And this was, this was big news to me because no, I didn't know mathematicians really existed and that mathematics was being done at that time because everything you learn in school is so old. The mathematics is generally or, over 100 years old. If you're studying music, you know music has been written in the last 100 years. If you're studying literature, you know literature has been written, books have been written, plays have been written. But in mathematics, you don't get that message so much. So you don't realize that, but when I discovered that I could just study mathematics, I, I just said, okay, bye-bye physics, bye-bye chemistry, no more experiments, no more lab work, I'll just do mathematics. And that was a, a big revelation to me, and I've enjoyed it so much ever since. So is it an uh, intuitive discipline? Uh, it's, it's some. I mean, some people like visual mathematics. John Conway, a very famous geometer and mathematician, has said that geometry is the user interface of mathematics, that if you have pictures, you will understand. When I was in university, pictures were out of fashion. Everything was very axiomatic and symbolic, and I liked that at the time. But I think it's good now to have pictures coming back in the curriculum, and we use visualization. Data visualization is a big thing today, using different geometries to visualize data very crowded pictures like a web network, you can visualize them using a different type of geometry than the usual. But if you don't know that, you, you won't find it. So I think um, you know, there's many, many more opportunities now for using mathematics. And as I get older and more experienced as a teacher and so on, I, I, I embrace many, if not all, the branches of mathematics. When I was young, I thought algebra, it has to be algebra. I don't feel that way now. I like many other branches too. Okay, thank you. And why do children in school always think this is the most difficult subject? Well, it is difficult, obviously, um, but so is learning a language, and mathematics is a language. And if you are trying to learn Spanish or French or Polish, you need to put work in other than just going to class and saying, oh yes, maybe I understood the teacher. You're not going to go home and say, tomorrow I'll be able to speak Russian or Polish. You know you have to practice, 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 put in some 
some serious work and repetitive work to get the basics down. And the same is true in mathematics. You can watch mathematics, watch somebody do mathematics and say, oh, I think I understand that. But two weeks later, if you have to do it on a test and you haven't practiced, you, you forget everything. So it, it does require a lot of effort and it is difficult. And also, it's, I, I don't know about here in Serbia, but in many countries, there's a problem with the adults, the teachers, not so much, but the parents. Uh, I mean, if I go to a party or I'm on a plane, sitting on a plane, and somebody says to me, what do you do? I usually say I'm a teacher or I'm a writer. And then if they say, what about? I say mathematics. And nine times out of 10, the person will say, I was never very good at mathematics or mathematics was my worst subject at school. And they're proud of it. If I said I teach French, somebody wouldn't say, oh, I was terrible at French or I hate French. Or if I said I teach English, people wouldn't say, I'm illiterate, I don't read. But somehow it's socially acceptable to say, I'm not good at mathematics or I don't like mathematics. And it's very difficult to fight that. But kids growing up know that. They, they hear their parents saying it to their neighbors. And, you know, I, I think it's a difficult situation because there's a kind of a social message that trickles down that maybe it's okay not to be good at mathematics. It varies by country. I think some countries do a better job. Um, but, you know, it is, it is difficult. And another problem in some cultures is that the teachers don't know, they don't have the advanced training and maybe they don't know as much about the subject. Again, you couldn't teach French if you didn't, if you weren't very fluent in French. You couldn't teach art if you didn't know a lot about art or be able to paint or teach music if you couldn't play a musical instrument very well and know a lot about the theory. But I think people do end up teaching mathematics um, at the lower level, sometimes in some countries where their basic knowledge is weaker and the students sense that, you know, it makes a difference. You can have a very inspired teacher, obviously James Tanton, who's one of the visitors here this month. He's a very enigmatic, energetic kind of a guy, and anybody in a room with him is going to be paying attention and listening and learning effectively. But unfortunately, not all teachers are, are that good. Okay, thank you very much. And what is the connection between the cards? And mathematics? Well, I never played cards much or was interested in gambling or anything like that. And then about 17 or 18 years ago, somebody told me about a particular type of mathematical card trick. And it's very simple. Somebody gives you any five cards from a package and you look at them and you give one back and you show the other four on a table. And then a friend of yours comes in and you have discussed in advance with the friend the mathematics that makes this possible. But the friend has not seen the cards and the friend looks at four cards and the fifth one is hidden, and the friend thinks and does some mathematics, and then she says, oh, I know the fifth card is, and she names it, and people turn over the card, and it's right. And it's incredible that this is possible. And I was told about this trick, that it existed, and um, I thought about it, and the friend who was telling me wanted to explain it. I said, no, 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 I want to think about this. This is interesting. And it took me two or three days to figure out all the details, and I was hooked. So I suddenly started looking for more tricks like that, and I suddenly got very interested in mathematical magic. And it became, you know, an obsession for a number of years. And I contacted a very famous man called Martin Gardner, who was an inspiration to many generations of people. He wrote a lot of books uh, many years ago um, about mathematics and mathematical magic and stuff like that and physics and so on. And I went through his books and I found more examples. And then I wrote to him and I said, I, I, I like what you've done about this. And he wrote back and he said, I encourage you to do more. And eventually, many years later, I wrote a book on it. So I, I really spent maybe seven or eight years focusing on that a lot. And I invented my own mathematical card principles and card tricks, which I was, it was fun. And I've been doing some of that with some of the children here. I went to the eighth uh, high school here in Belgrade yesterday. I met about 70 children and we had a great time and I explained some of these tricks. So maybe you could show us uh, some of the tricks. Yes, uh... I'd be very happy to. Let me demonstrate that card trick I discussed earlier. It's a quite an old trick. It dates back to the late 1940s. It was invented by a mathematician called William Fitch Cheney, who was the first man to get a PhD in mathematics from MIT. And uh, we start off with shuffling the deck, and this is completely genuine shuffling. There's no trickery here. It's a full deck of cards. I'm just mixing them up, and I'm going to take off five cards. It doesn't matter what they are. Now, my friend Colin here is going to help with this trick, and it's important that he doesn't see anything now, which is why he's hiding his face. So I'm going to look at these cards and make a mathematical decision 
and think about mathematics. Let's see. Uh, da -da -da -da. Okay. I'm now going to show in a row four of these cards where everybody can see. And the last one is going to be face down. Now, I claim that because of mathematics, my friend Colin here can look at these cards, four of five random cards, and mathematically, with certainty, will know what the fifth card is. So, Colin, are you ready? I'm ready. Are you ready? I'm not going to give many hints, no words, no physical cues. Okay. So, now I need to do the same piece of mathematics that Colin just did. Um, it's quite tricky. Uh, so, I think that the card is actually um, quite a large card. And in fact, I think it's quite a noble card. I think it's quite a large, noble card. And it's a wealthy card. I think, shall I do this or do you want to do this? Tell us what it is. I think it's the Queen of Diamonds. He thinks it's the Queen of Diamonds. Okay, so let's turn it over yeah, and you see. You cheating without you turning it over. It's the Queen of Diamonds. the Queen of Diamonds. Isn't mathematics wonderful? Okay, so let me try to explain to you how a trick like this can work. There are many details that I won't have time to go into, and I'm going to put these five cards away for a few minutes. But let's just talk about the basic ideas. When you take five cards from a package, they can be anything, with a few differences. You cannot have five cards of the same value because there's only four nines, four threes, and so on. And secondly, how many suits are there in a deck? There are actually uh, four suits. Clubs, spades, diamonds, and hearts. You might not get all of them, you have to get something, but because there are five cards and only four suits, you can be guaranteed that you will have two cards of the same suit. In this example, it will be two spades. Let's try the next five cards. So far, three different suits. That might, no, I got two clubs. And in fact, I got two clubs and two hearts. There might be many matches, but there have to be at least two cards of the same suit. So what we do is we focus on two cards of the same suit and the rest, it doesn't matter whether they're the same or different. Now when I show the four cards, I'm going to show one of these but not show the other. So for instance, I might put the king down and then I might put these cards down and uh, at the end, the fifth card. Now that fifth card is the same suit as this. So in the version we showed you, just to make it easy, the first card is always the same suit as the hidden card. Now, if you do the trick four or five times for the same people, they catch on, they understand, and they, they know one of your secrets. So there's a way to get around that. There's a way to change that so it's less obvious. But just to start off, we'll assume that's the case. So when I put the cards down, I'm always putting there a card of the same suit. There are 13 cards of each suit. That's a king. So the other card is obviously one of the other 12 cards. So somehow with these three cards, I have to communicate which of the other 12 hearts it might be. Now three things can be rearranged in many ways. You have three choices for the first card, you have two choices for the second, and once you've decided on those two, whatever's left goes in the third position. So you have three times two times one. Three factorial are six different things you can communicate. Six is only half of 12, and that's the first problem. And when this trick was explained to me that the trick existed, I went away thinking about it and I realized that yes, there's going to have to be a suit match and yes, you can communicate one of six things. But six again is not 12. So we need an extra bit of information or Dewey. And that, I was stuck on that for a little while, but then I had a flash of inspiration. And the extra part is that there's actually a choice about whether we show this card and hide that one or show that card and hide that one. And that choice is important because these two numbers represent, in this case, one and 13. The king is 13. Jack, queen, and king come after 10, so it's 11, 12, and 13. If you think of a regular clock with 12 hours on it, how far apart could any two hours be, like the second hand and the hour hand as they wander around? They could never be more than exactly opposite each other or six apart. If you have a 13-hour clock, which is what you can think of a suit of cards being, ace, being one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 
and then you have Jack, Queen, King. It's like a 13 hour clock, so the time counts past 13 and goes back to one. How far apart can things be if you have two of them? Again, actually, no more than six full hours, because if you had seven in both directions, that would be 14, which is longer than 13. So if you have two numbers, two cards of the same suit, these two, well, if you start at the ace and count to the king, it's 12 clockwise. But if you start at the king and count to the ace, it's only one. So there's always a short way and a long way to connect. We happen to have another suit match here, three and seven. Those are four apart the short way, and if you count from seven all the way around the 13 hour clock, I think it's nine. So it turns out that when you get your suit match, what you should do is the following. Let's just try a bunch of new cards here. We'll try one, two, three, four, five. Okay, once again I got an easy case where these cards are one apart and a case where they're five apart. Let's just go with the five this time. So I would look at these and say, these are five apart. So I will show the three and hide the eight. And with these cards, I have to communicate something. Now I have to tell the person which of the other 12 guys it is. I have to tell the person which of the other 12 spades it is. But I don't do that. I actually say, going around the clock, how far you have to travel. To travel from three to eight, you have to go through five. So I have to communicate five or in another example, one or two or three or four or six. A number between one and six, and that can be done. And that's just extra technical detail. What you do is you consider the whole pack of 52 cards as being in a particular order. Maybe you put the spades uh, first, and then the diamonds, and then the clubs, and then the hearts, whatever order you want. And you and your friend have to agree on this order. And if you have any three cards, one of them is closer to the middle, one of them is closer to the beginning, and one is closer to the end and there are six ways to rearrange those cards. And then you have to come up with a convention of communication. So in the example that we started with earlier, the actual performance example, I think these were the cards I was given after I shuffled. I looked at them and I quickly saw only one suit match this time. I saw a queen and a 10, and queen is 12, so I can get to the queen from the 10 by adding two. So I hid the queen, I played the 10, and I put these cards in an order which my accomplice knew would communicate to. So when he saw this card, these cards, he thought, but didn't say, it's got to be a diamond. And then he had to think, which diamond? He looked at these and he said, hmm, I think that's telling me two, add two. So it must be a queen. That there's a version of it I came up with, which is a little more complicated because it starts off with four cards. So it's possible to do a similar trick where you start off with four cards. Now you may or may not have a suit match. This time I happen to have a suit match, but that's not important. With these four cards, it's possible to hide one and show the other cards. Actually, maybe one of them face down, which seems to be less information. And my friend comes in, if we have agreed on the convention, he or she looks at these and says, hmm, and knows what that card is. And it even works, I promise you, if two of the cards are face down. And it could be like this, or like this, or it could be like this. And actually, and this is impossible to believe, it works if all three cards are face down. <laughs>